Hi guys, uh, welcome back or welcome along for the first time. Um, another glorious sunny Sunday morning and we're back off to Brands Hatch for the day. Uh, only the Indy circuit unfortunately, but we are going to see the super touring cars. So these were the, the touring cars from the 90s that were um, basically the pinnacle of touring car racing. So uh, we're here, we've had a good morning so far. We've stopped for the obligatory Sunday morning race day McDonald's breakfast. Um, the muffin was extra crispy, so we know it's going to be a good day. And Operation Brock was still on, unfortunately. Thanks, UK government. But we're here. So without further ado, let's go have a look at some race cars. So guys, what's this all about? Well, this is basically, it's a celebration of the BTCC or the touring cars going back from 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and noughties, really culminating in the, uh, the pinnacle of tin top BTCC, which was the super touring era, really from the early 90s through to the 2000s. I think the, the Ford Mondeo, the 2000 Ford Mondeo was probably the pinnacle of the technology on these cars. And although it was a British Championship, this really was like a, a world-class series at the time because you had uh, all the drivers from all over the world, professional racing drivers throughout the whole grid. Money was no object spent on some of the cars. And uh, it was just a fascinating period to grow up watching these racing. I've never been to see them live before, so it's a really nice day to come up here. We've got some, uh, we've got some actual live action with the Super Tourers out on track. We've got, uh, we've had a, we've had a pit, pit walk this morning, so we've walked up and down the pit lane and had a look inside some of the garages. Um, unfortunately, it was so busy down there that we couldn't talk you around the car, so I'll probably try and do a little voiceover of that for you folks to give you a, a talk through some of the cars we've seen. Then they've got a static display of some of the cars that aren't actually running out on track, again from the Super Touring era and earlier. They've got some Metros and some RS500s and all the classic cars. And then they've got um, a grid walk later on when they're all forming up on the grid. And like I say, a live race and qualifying on track with the cars throughout the years. So a really, really good day put on here. Um, I have to say, Brands Hatch is looking absolutely fantastic. MSV really do look after their circuits. And it's really busy. It's nice to see a lot of people out in the sunshine enjoying these old classic touring cars. A uh, bit of nostalgia, the smell of the fuel, the tyres and the bacon sandwiches is phenomenal. So first up, we have a 1999 Nissan Primera of Matt Neal. Uh, this is basically a works Nissan, although it was independently run by his father, father's team, Team Dynamics, Steve Neal's team. Uh, we'll look into some more details on these Nissans later on. So here we have the Volvo S40 of 1998. Uh, this was the driver's championship winning car, although Nissan did win the constructor's championship. You can see at the back end, you've got the obligatory rain light fitted and the rear exit exhaust. Um, by this point in the era, they were all spending so much money developing these cars, they were starting to move quite far away from the production car. You can see in the engine bay there, though they're still running a standard cable throttle, direct linkage, no fly by wire allowed on these cars. So now we're looking at the 1994 Ford Mondeo of Paul Radisic. This was, um, as you can see, Still quite production-based car at this point. The intake is still on the bulkhead side in the engine bay with this huge carbon air box to try and force as much air in there as possible. Again, we've got the oil preheater connected up there to heat the oil through the engine before starting. And when we go to the inside of the car, 
you can see it's still quite production based. You've still got the original dashboard. The uh, seat and position is quite standard. Um, and you'll see how this changes later on as we go through the years. Next up is the 1998 Peugeot 406. And here we can see how the aero at the front of the car with the front end off, you can see the underbody aero there and how low the engine is now sitting down in the engine bay. Um, this wasn't a particularly successful super touring car, but you can still see the technology that's had to go into this to even try and become competitive at this point. Now we're going to go around one of the, the greatest cars of this era, really. This is the 98-99 Nissan Works, Nissan Primera of David Leslie, um, run in period by Ray Malik Engineering. They were the constructors' champions of 98 and 99, even though they missed out on the drivers' championship in 1998. Um, by this point, the costs are really starting to spiral out of control and the cars are moving so far away from the production-based car so for the 98-99 season, they bought in a new rule of sprint and feature races. And for the feature race, there was a mandatory pit stop where you had to change at least two tyres on the car. So for this, the team's come up with these pneumatic jacks that pop out from underneath the car to lift it up to change the wheels and tyres. And that is powered, as you can see, by the uh, pneumatic cylinder that's plugged in just below the rear light at the back of the car. This is the sister car of Anthony Reid, 9899 Works Nissan Primera. As we can see when we look inside here now, there's huge differences to the production based car. So the, the dashboards, all carbon fibre and different. You've got the brake bias adjustment on the side, sequential gearbox. It looks like the two levers are some kind of anti-roll bar or rear suspension adjustment. The driver's seat's much, much further back and in the centre of the car to so try and get the centre of gravity towards the centre of the car and all the data logging equipment that's on there to try and get as much detailed information as possible. You can also see there the inside of the pneumatic lifting jack that we looked at previously, just down by the roll cage on the B pillar. And as we move round to the engine bay, you can see the differences here with these huge wheel tubs to try and allow these wheels to be fitted within the production shell. Um, you can see the cylinder head has been turned again 180 degrees to allow this big ram effect intake on the front of it. The engine is dry sumped so that it is low and as far back as possible to try and again move that centre of gravity back. We've actually got, if you look near the offside front wheel tub there. These vehicles had a bevel drive gearbox fitted for the steering system because the engine was so low, the steering rack couldn't be fitted in the original position. So it had to have this bevel drive gearbox set up on there. And again, dry sump oil tank there. Um, just huge, huge development at this point in the super touring era. One detail I do like is that they have by, by what it looks like kept the original Nissan power steering fluid cap, which is a nice touch. So here we have the 1999 Renault Laguna uh, that was still in partnership with the Williams Formula 1 engineering team. This vehicle was driven by Jason Plato and his teammate for the year was the Formula Williams test driver um, Jean-Christophe Bouillon. You can see here under the engine bay the remote reservoirs for the shock absorbers, uh, the dry sump system again, still got the mechanical throttle linkage and the cutouts in the wheel tubs there for the front suspension uprights to come through. Moving to the inside here, we can see the amount of strengthening added by the roll cage. Um, this production shell has been fully seam welded as well, so with this and the roll cage it really is a stiff, strong shell, body shell. Next up we're looking at the 2000 Vauxhall Vectra driven by Jason Plato. Um, in the year 2000, a lot of the manufacturers had left um, the Touring Car Championship just down to, to cost the loan, which left us with three Vauxhall, Ford and Honda uh, running works outfits. Um, Vauxhall this year filled in Jason Plato of Ann Muller and Vincent Rademacher. This formed quite a successful year for them, although they were beaten by all three Ford Mondeos of that year. Now we have the 1991 Vauxhall Cavalier um, run by Ray Malik and he ran the Vauxhalls from 1992 to 1996 and then went on to have some further success with uh, Nissan in the late 90s. 
Um, this car was driven by John Cleland and Will Hoy, and you can see here how a decade of difference between 1991 and 2000 really, the difference in the vehicle. So this is a far more standard production looking car. The engine is still in a standard position. The intake is still at the rear of the engine without the large forced ram air induction. The driver's seat is more in the normal position along with the dashboard, steering wheel, etc. And in the rear here, we can see the fuel being filled up with the fuel pumps and the swirl pots in there to stop any surging with the fuel. You can even see there, you've got the original rear number plate lights still fitted in the rear bumper, showing how much of a production-based car body shell this still is. This is a beautiful 1989 Ford Sierra Cosworth RS500. Um, this is Tim Harvey's saloon car in the British Touring Car Championship, built by Andy Rouse back in the day. Um, it's got the full Labatt sponsorship still on there. It ended up finished third in class for that year, and it is an absolutely stunning machine. Still very, very original. This wasn't actually out on track, but just nice to see. This is the 2003 Honda Civic driven by Tom Chilton, uh, run by Arena Motorsport. Although this isn't a Super Tourer from the 90s, um, under the Class TC3, they do allow the FIA S2000 regulation cars pre-2006 um, and invited cars to run in the same championship. So that's why this vehicle's here racing with these Super Tourers. Now last up in the garages we've got the 2000 Honda Accord uh, driven by Tom Christensen. Obviously Mr Le Mans went on to win many Le Mans races after this. Um, this was run by West Surrey Racing back in period. So that's all the cars lined up in the pit garages. As you can see very very busy down the pit lane today. Uh, so let's go and see them out on track with some live action.
just had the first Super Tour race of the day. Uh, we wanted to sit on the inside of uh, Druid's hairpin for that race. 15 minute race. Um, unfortunately, there's a red flag after um, three or four laps, accident of Paddock Hill Bend, which we didn't see. So it got red flags and stopped for a while. Gave us the opportunity to move to the outside of um, Druid's hairpin for the restart. Uh, Jake Hill won it in the Nissan Primera, one of the best cars with one of the best current drivers, so it's no surprise there. But he was given a good run by Stuart White in uh, one of Tom Christensen's old Honda Accords. So still going for it, they're still racing hard and racing properly. Um, Stuart White was a bit closer in the first few laps, but the, the current tyres they run them on are slightly harder than what they would have run in period, try and keep the costs down a little bit. And once Jake Hill had got the tyres up to full temperature, he sort of started to clear off a little bit. So good racing still, nevertheless. Good smells, good sounds. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to the next one. So these cars were on static display and also some of them done demonstration runs throughout the day, but they weren't actually racing as part of the Super Touring event. So here we have the 1994 BMW 318i, uh, driven by German driver Joachim Winkelhock, uh, who had won, won the title previously in 1993 and finished uh, sixth in the driver's standings in 94, finished in the iconic uh, Fina and Warsteiner livery, and it, this beautiful big carbon airbox plenum chamber on the intake there. So this is a 1972 BMW CSL Batmobile. I'm not sure if this is a genuine 3 litre CSL, but it is an absolutely beautiful car that is, as you can see, for sale. Um, it was called the Batmobile because of the iconic bodywork at the time, um, and it is really a thing of beauty. I mean, even just to have this as a picture on the wall is something nice to look at, let alone own something like this. So you can see there, absolutely stunning 3 litre straight six engine. I'm not sure if this is the original engine. I'm not that up to speed with my CSLs, but you can see how nicely presented that is with all that mechanical throttle linkage between the three pairs of... Tw of uh, twin Weber carburetors on there. What an absolutely lovely machine. You can also see there the adjustable brake bias just below them carburetors. Next up we have the 2004 Mondeo driven by Anthony Reid. Uh, the title was actually won in the sister car by Alain Menu by just two points. Very close title. And uh, like we said before, this really is the pinnacle of the Super Tours of the British Touring Car Championship. Um, you can see how all the evolution over the years has ended up with this you can see all the lovely beautiful carbon air box in there intakes you've got you can see the lsd there above the sequential gearbox uh, you can see the oil heater that's connected up there to preheat the oil to make the engine easier to turn over all the adjustable top mount suspension really is a, a special thing this now we're looking at a 1989 ford sierra cosworth rs 500 uh, this was prepared and run by Eggenberger Motorsport and actually won the 1989 Spa 24 Hours with drivers Wim Percy, Bernd Schneider, Gianfranco, Brancatelli. Uh, is a, if you look around this car and you think this is hammered around Spa for 24 hours, what an amazing, amazing piece of kit this is. Here we have a 1988 BMW M3 driven by Roland Ratzenberger. Finished in the iconic Demon Tweak livery. Again, another absolutely stunning car um, to look at. And finished 11th overall in the championship and 4th in Class B. And obviously, Roland Ratzenberger, F1 star, who tragically lost his life at Imola in 1994, was the pilot for this one. Here we have the 1999 Volvo S40, driven by Ricard Rydell and Vincent Rademacher. Uh, this was run by TWR, Tom Wilkinshaw Racing. And the iconic five-cylinder BMW, uh, five-cylinder Volvo engine in there, which won the title the previous year, and 1999 was the last year for Volvo in this championship of Super Touring after quite a successful campaign starting from 1994. Here we have the 1994 Volvo 850 R Estate, which is what Volvo entered the British Touring Car Championship with. It's a really, really iconic car driven by Ricard Rydell and Jan Lammers, who is also another XF1 star. 
Um, this really was the, a test bed for Volvo to enter the BTTC with, to then eventually um, develop their, their cars to go on to win the title in 1998. Uh, this finished 14th and 15th overall in the year, but like we say, it was building blocks of what was to come. Now we have a 2002 Peugeot 406 Coupe run by Tim Halfords, uh, driven by Tim Harvey, who was the 1992 BTCC champ. Uh, finished 10th overall, and it had a lot of uh, reliability issues, lots of DNFs throughout the season. And you can see in the engine bay there with these S2000 regs, um, the position of the engine and other components inside the engine bay, how the, there's less development with, with them than the Super Tourers. Now we have the 1997 Peugeot 406, again driven by Tim Harvey. Um, Peugeot never actually won a race in the Super Touring era at all, and they, this vehicle particularly wasn't very competitive, finished ninth overall in the Drivers' Championship, but it wasn't through lack of trying, as you can see all the engineering work that's gone into this car there. This is the 1995 Peugeot 405, driven by Patrick Watts. Um, it finished last in the Constructors' Championship and 10th in the Drivers' Championship, although it did manage to get it onto the podium twice during 1995. Now we have, for me, what is the absolute iconic touring car. This is what I remember seeing on the cover of the Toka Touring Car game for the PlayStation when I was growing up. And this is the 1997 Renault Laguna, run by Williams Grand Prix Engineering and Renault. Um, this was driven by the Swiss touring car race Alain Menu and Jason Plato, obviously now a stalwart of touring car racing. Uh, this car took Alain Menu to his first world title and absolutely dominated the year. He had a record 12 wins during the season in this car and he ended up winning the title with six races remaining. So a really, really iconic car in the era of Super Touring. And lastly on display here in this uh, demonstration car setup is the 1996 Honda Accord. This was driven by David Leslie and James Kay. Uh, David Leslie had three wins through the season, including the home win at Silverstone. You can see there the twin caliper water-cooled brake caliper setup, and the transverse engine had the cylinder head swapped 180 degrees round to allow the intake to allow the ram air system to work on the intake. So this was quite a revolutionary car at the time. Let's have a look at some of them out on track. the race cars we're going to go and have a look around at some of the road cars now that people have brought along and put on display and see what interesting vehicles we've got over there Thank you. 
So here we are guys, walking down to the grid at Brands Hatch Indy Circuit. Have to say the circuit is looking marvellous today in the summer sunshine. Um, just thought we'd take this opportunity to run through not only the grid, but a few of the rules and regulations from this Super Touring era. So the Super Tourers actually ran from 1991 through to the year 2000. And the cars, they were based, they had to be based on a four-door family saloon cars, which stopped them using uh, three-door hatchbacks. And they had to be over a certain length as well, the actual vehicle itself. They had to have 25,000 of these cars sold before they could be homologated to race in the championship. Um, if we just pause there and, and explain this crowd here at the front of the grid, um, they're actually surrounding Matt Neal's old Nissan Primera, as unfortunately... Um, the news was passed over the tannoy today that the, the his father, the founder of Team Dynamics Motorsport, uh, Steve Neal, had sadly passed away. So it was a really, really nice touch by MSV and Brands Hatch there to put Matt Neal's old Primera right at the front of the grid. Um, so that's what the that's what the crowd around the car is at the front there. So we were saying 25,000 cars had to be produced before they could be homologated. They had to use the original production shell. Um, the external lights all still had to operate. The minimum weight limit was dependent on the drive train, whether it was front wheel drive, four wheel drive, rear wheel drive, etc. So looking at the engines, they all had to be a maximum of a two litre capacity, all normally aspirated and no more than six cylinder. The manufacturer, you could use a different engine from the same manufacturer, i.e. if Ford wanted to use their three and a half litre V6, they could use that. It didn't have to be the engine out of the car. As long as there was over 2,500 of those engines sold in production, they could use any engine from the range, but they had to still adhere to the 2-litre capacity limit. They had an 8,500 RPM rev limit, which was mandated by the FIA, and that was uh, regulated and enforced with data logging software. The engine had to stay in its original orientation, i.e. whether it was a transverse or longitudinal engine, and the drivetrain also had to stay as original. Um, because of the success of the Audis when they came in, they were actually, four-wheel drive was banned from the end of 1997. The, the brakes, the discs and calipers, there wasn't many regulations on these. Basically, the, the disc had to be a ferrous material, so it couldn't be like a composite carbon material or anything like that. And the size limit really was governed by the wheel size, the wheel diameter of what you could get over the brake discs. And for the calipers, they had to be made of aluminium, but there was actually no limit to the amount of calipers per wheel or anything like that. As for the transmission, uh, they were allowed to have purpose-built racing gearboxes, but they couldn't have any electronic control of the clutch or the gearbox, and the sequential gearboxes were accepted as well. That wasn't a problem to run a sequential gearbox. So that's a little bit about the technical regulations of the cars, a little bit of basic stuff there. Let's just run through the grid as we're walking up there. So we've got Jake Hill from Anthony Reid on the front row, both in the Nissan Primeras. Next up, we've got Jason Hughes and Stuart White. Jason in the Vauxhall Vectra and Stuart in the Honda Accord on the second row. Then we have Stephen Richards in the Volvo S40 and Greg Murphy in the Nissan Primera, which was the Matt Neal Primera at the front of the grid. That's why it's missing from the grid slot. Then we've got Alexander Morgan in the Vauxhall Astra. That is, again, the same as the Honda Civic running in the TC3 class, and he is alongside Alan Scott in the Mazda 323. Then on the next row, we have Nigel Arkell in the Honda Accord and Richard Wheeler in the other works Nissan Primera. And then we have Paul Radisic in the Ford Mondeo lining up alongside Mark Jones in the Renault Laguna. Jim Pocklinton in the Vauxhall Cavalier alongside David Power in the Ford Mondeo. Adam Woods in the Honda Civic, like we said before, the TC3 class car. Next, alongside Conrad Timms in the Ford Mondeo. And at the back of the grid, Colin Salter in the Peugeot 406. To be honest with you, the grid is very, very resemblant of the grid back in the day in the actual era. The Nissans are up the front, followed by the Hondas and Vauxhalls, very competitive. The Volvos are up there as well, and then you've got the Renaults and the Peugeots at this point in the championship, late 90s, more towards the back of the grid. 
So that's the grid lineup for the first race of the Sunday around the Indy circuit. So across the 10 years of the Super Touring, there was obviously 10 drivers' champions. And if we could run through those quickly, in 1991, we had Will Hoy driving for BMW. 92 was Tim Harvey, again driving for BMW. 93 was Johan Winklehock, again driving for BMW. So you can see at the beginning of this era, the BMWs are very, very strong. 94 was Gabrielli Tarquini for Alfa Romeo. 95 was John Cloland and his Vauxhall Cavalier. 96 was Frank Beeler in his Audi. 97 was Alain Menu in the Renault Laguna. 98 was Ricard Rydell for Volvo. 99 was Laurent Aiello for Nissan. And 2000 was Alain Menu for Ford. So you can see there's a range of manufacturers that have won the title over those years. And the only person to do a double championship was Alain Menu. We just want to take the opportunity now just to say thank you to everybody involved in making this event happen. All the marshals giving up their time, their weekends to come and marshal the circuit. And all of the people who bring the cars, run the cars, MSV, Browns Hatch themselves. Just a big, big thank you for making this event happen. It's a spectacular event. And I'm so pleased to see everybody coming out and making it such a, such a positive, busy event. And hopefully we can run more of these in the future. So it is a really healthy, strong grid, 17 cars in total, and I can't wait to see some action. So here we are, we've just pulled up home in the van. I uh, just thought we'd give you a quick quick rundown of uh, what the day was like, an overview of it quickly. So we we left after the second Super Touring race of the day. Unfortunately, we couldn't stay for the last two races. It was a Formula Ford race and another classic touring car race that we had to miss out on, unfortunately. Um, but it did mean the track was a little bit quieter when we left. I mean, the circuit today was a little bit quieter than a BSB meeting, but still really, really busy. Um, but yeah, it did mean that we could get out a little bit easier. So the last Super Touring race, uh, Stuart White actually got in front of Jake Hill, first time this weekend, I believe. Um, and then on the first proper racing lap, he spun at clearways, uh, went into the gravel, back onto the track a little bit and, and then retired after that. And that left, um, that left Jake Hill to beat Jason Hughes and Anthony Reid in that order. Um, now, he said that the reason he spun was he wasn't sure if it was oil or something on the track. Um, from where I was stood, I was actually stood on clearways and got a bit of footage from that. Obviously, I wasn't driving the car, but it looked like it was a little bit wider, potentially some slightly cold rear tyres, and the back end just got away from him a little bit. But, you know, you're not in the car, so you never know. But, yeah, really good race. However, it wasn't the best race of the day. The best race of the day was the, um, the penultimate 
pre-1966 race. So there, that was between a Mark I Jaguar and an Austin Cooper S. And for 15 laps, the Cooper S was quicker. It was real David versus Goliath. The Cooper S was quicker in the corners. The Mark I Jag obviously on the straights. And they were diving up and out the inside of each other over and over again. So that was a really, really entertaining race for the whole 15 laps. So I'd put that one down as the best race of the day. So that might have been the best race of the day, but what we really went for was the Super Touring cars, uh, as I said earlier on. So actually reading the programme, they it is part of the classic touring car championship. So they only attend three rounds of the year from what I can make out. Um, and the grid, it's a fairly decent spread of cars, to be honest, considering the cost that it must cost to run these cars. It's quite a good, a good spread of cars. It'd be nice to see a few more from from back in the era, but I mean, to be honest, just to have them out actually racing in anger is a fantastic thing. And they're all immaculately turned down. So a lot of these cars, when you actually see them close up, race cars, race bikes, they're not that clean and tidy, but they were really, really nicely presented today. So that's fantastic to see. Um, if you want any more information on that, you can go to the classictouringcars.com website, and I believe there's a lot of information on that. I was also put onto today to another podcast I'd like to try and listen to. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of motorsport, motorsport podcasts out there for everything, but this one I've not heard of before, so I'd like to try, and it's called Stories from Super Touring. So I'm going to give that a go. I spend a lot of time in the van travelling. So that will be one that I like to, to put on and have a little listen to that. It was a great day for the family. Um, the entrance price was £30 on the gate, £25 um, pre-order online, if you're organised enough to do that. Uh, and kids under 13 go free. So really, really good. A nice day out for the, for, the, for the kids. I took my eldest boy and he had a fantastic time. The only thing I would say, as with any racetrack really in the UK, is unless you want to take out a second mortgage for some lunch, try and take some stuff with you, tea, coffees, snacks and things like that in a bag because, well, the prices, to be honest, the prices everywhere are expensive for food now, but they are extortionate at racetracks and always have been. So that's not, uh, that's not something that you should forget. During the day, there was some great access to the drivers of the cars, the staff of the cars, people that look after them. Um, if autograph hunting is your kind of thing and you're collecting autographs, absolutely fantastic um, access for all of that kind of stuff. So that was really, really good. There was a sad announcement over the tannoy during the day um, about the passing of Steve Neal, um, Matt Neal's dad and founder of the Team Dynamics team. Matt Neal was the... <sighs> was the first independent guy back in the 90s, I think it was 99, yeah I'm sure it was 99 in Nissan Primera, they awarded a prize fund, I think it was something like 200 or 250,000 pounds for the winner, they're the first independent team to win an outright race and I believe in 1990, 1999 he won a race outright as an independent team, so Steve Neal was his dad founder of Team Dynamics Motorsport unfortunately passed away so that was that was said today so yeah overall a fantastic day really really good fun it just makes me want to get back out on track and get that adrenaline and that buzz from the spirit of competition you know have some fun and actually get that feeling of driving something fast again so that's driving it on the edge um, I love watching motorsport but I love doing it and being involved even more so time to get back out on track somewhere soon hopefully i'm not a motorsport photographer and the equipment i've got is not built for motorsport photography but i've tried to get a few videos for you guys for people who couldn't make it along or people who show an interest in it hopefully it gives you a little bit of a behind the scenes of what goes on during the day um and you need to try and get yourself out to the next one because it is brilliant fun for the day it's nice to see so uh Thanks very much for watching again, guys. Hopefully we'll see you again soon. Um, leave some comments below on what you like, don't like, what you want to see some more of. Auf Wiedersehen!